Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says, and God blessed the seventh day. So remember, there's something special about the seventh day of God's creation. He blessed it and sanctified it. So he made it holy. So to him, it is something very special, which is why I encouraged you to study Sabbath in the Bible. All right. So if you study the Sabbath or the number sevens, there's so many gleanings to get. The Bible says, because that in it, he had rested. So at that seventh day, he rested. So remember, that means that he stopped from all his work, which God created and made every work. So his handiwork of the world, he created and he made it. He rested from all that. He stopped from doing that. So I address the atheist arguments concerning that part about, well, God was so tired he took a break. No, it just means that he stopped. Now we're going to expound verse 3. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Now, because God did something very special on the seventh day, he wanted people to remember what he did. Wow, this pen is destroyed too. I must have like really pressed these uh, markers really hard. All right. Can you catch these? Thank you, brother. All right. Okay. So the seventh day, he did something very special to it. And that's found in Genesis chapter 2. So what God wants the children of Israel to do is to keep it in mind now. Because when he did that, the children of Israel have not been following the Sabbath and the seventh day. Why is that? Because God didn't ordain or give the command until now, until the law of Moses. So that's why he told them to recollect, to remember what he did on the seventh day. That way they can follow it. All right, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20. And then notice that the Bible says in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. So notice that within six days God made heaven and earth. So he's talking about the six days of creation, the sea and all that in them is. But then, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So that's why he says at verse uh, eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So that's why he told the children of Israel to remember the Sabbath. Why? Because as he explained, during my six days of creation, I made everything, but the seventh day I rested. So there's a reason. So I want you to remember. Now, the seventh day Adventists, they argue this way. And remember, they're very clever with scripture. They're going to argue at verse eight, remember the Sabbath day. Why do they say that? Because when you go back to Genesis 2, it says that, remember, God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. So then they say, see, God did something very special on Saturday. So why aren't you observing it? Well, it's very easy. What you have to do is when you read Genesis chapter 2, all it said was God considered the seventh day to be special. He never commanded Adam. He never commanded anyone at Genesis 2 to keep the Sabbath day. Do you see that? You don't see that anywhere. It just says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Isn't God's book holy? Yeah, God's book is holy. That doesn't mean that we have to have a special day of remembrance about the Bible. So they always have some funny things. Now, knowing that the seventh day or the Sabbath is something very special, the seventh day Adventists will argue, well, in Exodus 20, it says to remember so in other words, they did observe it before. So because they observe it before, God is reminding them about what they observed back then. Right. Now, because the Seventh-day Adventists, they'll argue that way to try to trick you. The easy answer to that is no, because if you look at going back to Exodus chapter 20, and we mentioned about verse 8, God said, remember the Sabbath day. Why? Because he's explains to them, verse 10 and 11, his days of creation. So the reason why God said to remember, it doesn't mean remember back at Genesis 2, you guys observe it. No, God's saying remembering now at Exodus 20. 
Now, I want you to remember. How do you know that? Because he brings up the six days of creation after that. So he's saying, remember the Sabbath day. Why should we remember it? Why should we keep in mind? Why should we remember, remember it? Because... The reason why is because of the six days of creation that I did. I blessed and sanctified it. And they go, oh, I see. But not only that, if you look at the passage over here, the commandment is not given about observing the Sabbath day unless it was to Jews. It was a sign that was only given to the nation of Israel. It wasn't given to the whole world. Time. It wasn't on the law of Moses. So it's important to understand that the law of Moses, it was given to the children of Israel and it was not given to the whole world. We're going to look at uh, Exodus chapter 20 and notice what the Bible says concerning about the Sabbath here. He goes all the way back at verse 1 and verse 2. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So who is he speaking to, obviously? He is speaking to Jews. He spoke to the whole world to observe this. I mean, he never told Adam that. You can't find a verse anywhere in the entire Bible where he told Adam to observe the Sabbath day. So it's important to understand these facts. That way the Seventh-day Adventists, they don't have a hold on. Uh, moreover, if you go to the book of Colossians, turn to your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Go to Colossians. And then we'll look at chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. Now, notice that the Bible says that the Sabbath are not for us to observe. And if the Seventh-day Adventists that the Sabbath has been something all the way from the past. So Sabbath observance. So remember, God considers the Sabbath day to be something special. But... It's not Sabbath observant from the beginning till now. It's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath from the beginning to now. How do you know that? So, okay, why uh, am I out of bounds? Do they read all the words here? Okay, just making sure. All right, so then um, at uh, number seven here, the seventh day has always been here from the beginning of time till now. There were always seven days in a week. See, God always put a seventh there. So there was a seventh. There was a Sabbath from beginning to now, but there was no Sabbath observant from the past till now. There wasn't. You know, here's the ugly verse. This verse says Sabbath observant won't happen until the future. <laughs> so forget the past. So it's not something that was observed all the way from the beginning of the past. If God jumps it to the future, Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or respect of an holiday, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Now look at this, which are a shadow of things to come. Yep. See, it's only at the future the Lord's going to put it. Now go to Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9. If you think that the people always knew about the Sabbath observant from the beginning of Adam till now, then why is it God said it wasn't until God gave the law to Moses at Sinai that they knew, that they know about observing the Sabbath. I mean, it says that it was made known to them at Mount Sinai. Not all the way at the beginning. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9. And then we'll look at verse 13. Verse 13. It was at Mount Sinai with Moses. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven. And gave us them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Right? At Sinai. It was at Sinai, verse 13, verse 14, and made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath by the hand of Moses thy servant. Okay, so it wasn't through Adam. It was through Moses. All right, look, who taught you about Sabbath observance? Isn't that a basic question? 
What's Ten Commandments? Seventh-day Adventists make a big deal about Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. Well, when did it start then? Adam? Did Adam have the Ten Commandments or Moses? How about that? All right, go to Genesis now, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So this is the arguments that you can use against the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we're going to go to verse 4. Now, here we start the interesting portions, all right? And hopefully we'll go through all of them. Verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Now, notice that the Bible says that the heavens, plural, and of the earth. Why? Because the reason why is God created everything this time. God created everything. So all three heavens. So the three heavens, as I briefly mentioned last time, first heaven is the sky, second heaven is where you get outer space, and then the third heaven is where God is living and residing. So then God created everything and the earth, but the, God calls it, these are the generations. Did you notice that? So he called it plural. That's important to understand. So God considers everything of what he created here to be considered as, uh, we'll put it here, all right. So he considered all this to be generations, plural, plural. So this is going to be kind of out of bounds, but I don't care. All right, don't move the camera. All right. Good, good. So he says it's generations. So meaning the lifetime, right? So we have our own generation, our generations. So meaning our chronology, our background, correct? So God's saying that everything that he created, this is considered to be generations. Now that's a question here. So he calls it plural generations, but keep reading. When they were created. So it's talking about the creation of everything he created. In the what? Day, singular, that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now he switches. He calls this a singular day where the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So he now refers to all this as a single day. So then we got a problem here. The problem is, remember, we argued at Genesis chapter 1, Day means literally 24 hours. Because remember, evolutionists, they try to argue, well, when the Bible talks about the first day, the second day of what God created, it means long ages of time. It doesn't mean 24 hours. And Genesis chapter 2 seems to be the proof text of that, at verse 4. So it says, one single day God created everything. So then, uh, how do we tell the difference? So the, the critics must be right. No, the critics cannot be right. The evolutionists aren't right. How do you know that? Because, very simple, Genesis 1, it has six days. Genesis 2 is a single day. So, obviously, the rule of contrast is important. One of biblical hermeneutics that you want to know. I love biblical hermeneutics. That's one of my favorite studies, if not the favorite study. That's, where, that's why I was very good at dispensationalism. That's why a lot of people get interested in the way I explain teachings. It's because of biblical hermeneutics. So I'm giving you some secrets here, all right? It's the rule of contrast. That's very important to understand. In the rule of contrast, you have to understand that how we can tell which interpretation is, uh, why the interpretation is not going to be 24 hours or it's going to be long ages of time is because these two contradict each other. See that? So that doesn't mean that they're same, that they're both the same interpretation. Why came up with dispensationalism? Because they contradict each other, but they both must be true, but they're definitely contradicting each other. So they both mean different meanings. That's the same thing in this one. So for a PhD professor, he sure don't know what a difference with day and days is. Did you met any child, six-year-old, who knew that, I mean, they know what a single day is or a days are, but I, I, except a PhD professor, I guess, who knows so much about research and statistics and thinks that he or she is better than you. Well, make fun of them. Use that one time, all right? 
ask them, do you know the difference with day is with days? Do that, all right? See them shoot off their mouth after that and blubber. Now, if we look back at the rules of contrast, another reason is this. Remember, verse 4, uh, the rule of interpretation is that you have to look at the context. The verse itself will reveal figurative or literal. That's simple. The verse itself will show you if it's figurative or not. So rule number one is rule of contrast. So let's put this as number one. And then number two, the rule of contrast is the verse itself will show figurative interpretation. You don't have to force it to be figurative. If you, you, if you let your mind show you the verse to be figurative, then your mind will make you see anything that you want to see. But if you let the verse show you that if it's figurative, then you let the Bible show you whatever the Bible wants you to All see. Right. All right, isn't that the right way to do things? So let's look at verse 4. These are the what? Generations. Oh, and that's considered one day. There you go, your interpretation. Wasn't that easy? So easy, but you get Bible scholars. William Lane Craig, great apologist for, in apologetics for the existence of God philosophy. But man, he made that mind his God, even though he didn't mean to. And he let his mind dictate to him the interpretation of the Bible. Watch him interpret the Bible. He can teach well in philosophy, the existence of God, the Kalam cos cosmological argument or something that's called that way to that effect. But he can't teach you Bible. It's, he's the poorest Bible interpreter that I ever met. And that's to a guy that I highly respect. Why do I bring him up? Why do I say that? To show you that this should be simple, so don't let Bible scholars fool you. But Christians go by Bible scholars rather than the Bible itself. So the Bible interpreted for you. Now, we're going to look at, I'm going from memory here, Amos 9. Amos 9. So hopefully this is the right passage. We're going to go to Amos chapter 9. While you're turning over there, another argument that I want to bring up is that the Bible also shows about the day of the Lord. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Day of the Lord. Now, think about it. The day of the Lord is referred to, if you know your Revelation study, or if you've looked up every single verse in the Bible that talks about day of the Lord, you know that's not referring to one single day. It talks about the world set, being set on fire, blowing up. It talks about God coming down at Armageddon to rule the world. It talks about a time period where even some sort of rapture is mentioned about Jesus Christ coming. Yeah. You see all that? So all of these cannot be in one 24-hour period. There's a whole bunch of uh, events or, uh, or days Within what? One single day. Day of the Lord. That's good, Pastor. Day of the Lord. So let that dawn on you. By the way, the day of Christ, day of Christ, you'll find out that it refers to the judgment seat of Christ as well as the rapture for Christians. Notice over there that you can't put all that within one 24-hour period. How about that? Okay, uh, we're going to look at, uh, I think it's Hosea. So let's go to Hosea 9. Hopefully, this is it. So, I can't find that text. I was hoping I would find that text. Oh, ah, it's Hosea 7. Hosea 7. I found it. All right. Hosea 7. Now, notice here that this is a, a scripture with scripture. Third rule of interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Third rule of interpretation, which tr trumps... Quite often is scripture with scripture. How you know a heretic is where they always use figurative interpretation, one rule, and that's it. And then you know a heretic if he only uses one rule, scripture with scripture, that's it. You have, these rules cannot contradict the other rule. Does that make sense? 
So there are these uh, people who dub themselves to be Bible believers, but they play around going verse after verse after verse to create an interpretation, and you got to distort, and that's even worse than a figurative mindset. The reason why a scripture with scripture is you're finding words that connect anywhere to create some kind of wacky interpretation. That's even way worse than figurative. Because a figurative mindset, they try to go at least by a common sense mentality. But the scripture with scripture mindset, they create everything in their own little world mindset. That's even more dangerous. That's typical onlineers who don't get along well with the common sense world, actually. So you got to watch out for these people. I mean, you get crazy people who graduate from Bible-believing schools, PBI. You get wacky ones. So, uh, and who's to say I got wacky ones watching me online right now, probably. So that's why we started RBB Connect. So we have a huge burden about that one. That way people can be filtered out from their own world and understand real-life situations in the, in the real world and among Bible-believing churches. For some people curious, just go to connect.realbiblebelievers.com. All right, Hosea chapter 7. All right, I better get going. Otherwise, I'm not going to get to the interesting stuff. <laughs> now, notice here that the Bible says at verse 2, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. So notice here that at verse 2 and verse 3, these wicked Jews have caused and influenced their king to fall into sin with them. Now, let's use our brains here. This is a long moment of time, right, at Hosea chapter 7. The Jews have been doing this with their wicked king, sinning against God for a long time, right? So this is a long span of time. But notice how the Bible words it. Verse 4, look at the figurative language here. They are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker. See that word as? See, so it shows a figurative language. An oven heated by the baker, so this is figurative, who ceases from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day, see that singular? Within that figurative context of verse 4, making bread and what? Drinking. So verse 4 is figurative for food. Verse 5 is figurative for drinking. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. See that? Now some portions of that can be literal and physical. I'm sure they sin by getting drunk. But you sure can't take that sense at verse 4 about, uh, about the bread. Sure, they made it leaven too. They may have sinned against God with that. But at verse 4 and 5, you see the context follows with ass. At verse 4, as. And then when God calls them adulterers here at verse 4, remember, I don't know if you knew this, but the book of Hosea, God says that, especially chapter 1, when you went after other gods, when you sinned, you committed adultery against me. See, so he doesn't mean like literal, physical, like, you know, you've had, uh, you know, uh, you cheated on me with sexually, etc. This has to do with something that's spiritual. So this is, notice the figurative language that is filled out here. That's why God puts what in the figurative language of verse 4 and 5? Single day. So then we can keep an eye out that day can be figurative. Remember that, okay? All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Genesis chapter 2. So then the Bible will show you, all right? So the Bible will always show itself. Amen. Now let's look at verse 5. And every place of the field before it was in the earth and herb at verse 4 God talks about this is everything that I created including verse 5 every plant that you'll find in the field and every herb that you'll find in the field but notice it says every plant before there were plants in the earth every herb before you see them grown know this I was the one who created people who don't see that go to Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 God made it very clear that everything of nature you're looking around you stupid biologists and then worshiping evolution and science like God remember this it didn't create it by itself I did it so before 
all the plants and vegetation life that you see and the growth that you see, the wonders, science is wonders. Why? Because it's God's creation. You're looking at God's handiwork. It's, it, it's, science is a great thing, but I don't believe in science falsely so-called. When they dub themselves to be scientists, no, they're not being scientists. They're being, mytho they're being mythological. They're believing in fairy tales. And then the pagans, and then today's Eastern religions, they worship nature like it created itself. So look at Romans chapter 1. Notice what God says. At verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are cle clearly seen. That's what God said in Genesis 2. Every plant that you see in the field and every herb that grows in the field, just know that be before it even grew that I was the one that created it. So he's saying, all this are clearly seen from my creation. So that it's his eternal power and Godhead that they are without excuse. But look what they did. They look uh, at verse 21, uh, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's what they did. They worshiped the creation more than the creator. And they say, oh, I'm so smart. Oh, I'm so wise. God says, you're a fool. Go to Genesis chapter 2 again. Genesis chapter 2. Now, God says that everything of vegetation and life that is being seen, he says that... Uh, before every plant that was in the field and herb that grew in the field, he created and made them. Why did he create and made them? Because the natural workings of science, where you get rainfall and etc., were not operating that time. So notice that it reads over here, the next part, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So the first part says God didn't cause it to rain. He didn't, uh, he didn't cause the natural creation itself to provide rain on the earth. And there was no farmer or man to till the ground. So to till the ground to create uh, vegetation and fruit. So there was none of that. So that's why God created it. Verse 6, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So the ground, or the face of the ground, so that's the idea, the surface yeah. of the ground. God says that uh, there was a mist that came up from the earth. So below ground, for some weird reason, there was a mist that would come out. And then it would provide the water and the humidity that vegetation needed. So it came from the midst. It came from the ground below. So that's how the Lord provided. Now, going back over here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So God formed, he shaped man, Adam, of the dust of the ground. He used the dust from the ground to create Adam. So uh, it is very interesting. Alvin Douglas, he claimed uh, in his book that 99% of all the chemicals you'll find within our body would be throughout all the elements of our earth, actually. So it's very interesting. I don't know how much of that is true, but I do believe that a huge significant percentage at the very least of our body is from the earth. I mean, think about it. Why do evolutionists teach that our origins come from the earth anyway, right? So, uh, it looks like you have a comment, brother. Okay, science whiz, what do you say? All right, good. So I have confirmation. All right, from a from a guy who won a scholarship at Berkeley. All right, so that should be validation on my part. Okay, thank you, brother. All right, let's look at the next part of verse seven. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So God breathed into him. So God breathed into Adam. Uh, the Bible says the breath of life. I'm just running out of room here. I thought that I would have plenty of space, but I guess not. So, okay. So uh, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, the Bible says, a living soul. So man 
became soul through God breathing into him. So we see here body, soul, and spirit. You might say, really? How so? How it's body, soul, and spirit is as follows. Is because notice that from uh, one here, it says God formed man from the dust of the ground. So there's your body. Did you see that in the text there? And then it says breathe into his nostrils. So God breathed into Adam. So there's your spirit. Spirit, if you look up that word, both in uh, just the English dictionary itself, it would come from where it talks about the trace words come from wind, and then it also comes from uh, liveliness, or uh, pneumatics, uh, they talk about um, from the word, that's a Greek term, from spirit pneuma, and that means uh, wind. So there's technology that has, uh, that I actually worked as a, in sales work for, I think they termed it pneumatics. pneumatics. Yeah, pneumatics. But then all this has to do with equipment that has to do with wind, so to speak, or air and etc. So that's where you get your spirit. So, and then it says, and man became a living soul. So then soul is in place. Now notice, very interestingly, who do you think is going to be the real you from this passage? Look at that verse carefully, all right? I don't want to interpret it for you. I don't want to explain it for you. I want you to look at it yourself. And then you don't have to say it out loud, but think in your mind, all right? We see God created body and God put spirit there. But the real Adam, the real him... Do you think it would be when he breathed or when he put the body or do you think it's man became a living soul or is it his soul? So then the real you, think about it, when you die, goes to heaven, which is your soul, not the body that goes in the grave. The Bible says that our spirit is up in heaven with Jesus Christ right now. Amen, bless God. But, the, uh, but when we look at ourselves... Our real me, I'm not up there locationally right now. Why? That's referring to the spiritual part. The spiritual part. So it's important to understand that body, soul, and spirit, that we have these three, but the real us is the soul. The real us is the soul. That's important to understand. That is the real you. Now, returning back uh, to our text here, at verse 8. So understand that that's a starting rule of interpretation that will be eye-opening throughout the rest of the scriptures. Is that If you start out as the real me is soul, then when the Bible talks about you, 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 and then he assimilates that with body a lot, you see as a reference to lost people or in your past if you were a lost sinner. If he talks about you, 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 and referring to you in your spiritual nature, then you see right here the real you, the soul, becomes part of the spiritual nature this time, not the fleshly nature. If you started with that rule of thumb at Genesis, it would have been very eye-opening throughout the rest of your Bible reading. So I'm giving you a huge clue. I wish I can get into these verses, but if I do that, I'm going to miss out the big interesting ones that you want, you're waiting to hear, all right? So just keep that in mind. Today is a, the, one of the best Genesis studies that you'll probably get. Amen. So you came at the right time. Now going to verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. That's important. So notice that the garden of Eden is not Eden itself. That's important to understand. Now, there are a few times in the Bible where God will say um, Eden as a reference to the Garden of Eden, you'll notice that there are some times that the Lord will do that. However, in this particular passage, it's impossible. We know as a matter of fact from this passage that the Garden of Eden is not Eden. Why? Because it's, he's, the Bible says he planted a garden eastward. So it's at the east side, the east side of Eden, the location. So the Garden of Eden is at the east side of Eden. That's important to understand. Now the question then is, what is Eden? 
Good, we got plenty of time. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Go to Ezekiel 28. All right. Ezekiel chapter 28. If you look up every reference in the Bible that refers to Eden, it could be a reference to a particular location of land. So if you look up every reference to the word Eden. So that's possibility one. Possibility two, which is very interesting, and credit to whom credit's due, is that uh, this is not knowledge that I accumulated myself. It's knowledge that I accumulated from other Bible-believing preachers, which is why I keep strongly recommending attend a Bible-believing church. It's so important because by attending there, then you're going to accumulate and grow in knowledge. Not just uh, don't just stick to an online world. You got to attend a church. That's how I mean. How did I get my knowledge? You think that I got it from online? <laughs> I'm familiar with a lot of things online, but I'll tell you where I get my Bible knowledge from. I get it from Bible-believing churches, an accumulation of it. So it's so important to attend and to grow. Now go to Ezekiel chapter 28. So this is what I learned from other Bible-believing preachers. So possibility one, it's a reference to a location. Possibility two, it, it's a reference to a mountain. Look at verse 13. God is speaking to Satan. Thou hast been in Eden. The garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. So notice that we can see at verse 13, God talks about Eden. And he talks about the garden of God in Eden as well. So we can see Eden assimilated with garden in this passage, like I mentioned before. But then in Genesis 2, undoubtedly, that uh, it says eastward of Eden, the garden. So if we look at Genesis 2, it is different. But why would it put garden in the same assimilation with Eden? It could be a garden that's on the east side of the mountain of Eden. That's why God assimilated the two as the same place. Because keep reading. Thou, so Satan has been in Eden, right, at verse 13? But notice what God calls this at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the what? Holy mountain of God. Isn't that interesting? How about that? Look at verse 16. Satan, when he sinned, the Bible says at verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. See, he was in there. He was in the mountain, and verse 13, it says thou hast been in Eden. So Eden could be a reference to the mountain. And this would make even more sense when we come across these four rivers, mysterious rivers that are mentioned. And I want to mention them before Genesis is over. So the people who missed out, really missed out, right? Going back to Genesis 2. I hope that they'll watch this video. All right. Genesis chapter 2. All right. So we see here that it can be a reference to the mountain. So remember, two possibilities. I'm not saying Eden is a mountain. I'm saying that Eden is possibly a mountain. The reason why is, is when you look up every reference to the word Eden, it can refer to locations. So who knows? It could be a location or it could be mountain. But the reason why I'm not ref going to every passage that mentions Eden is because the mountain of Eden seems like a more interesting and a more likely prospect, actually. So, and plus, you can do the homework yourself. Just, it's easy. Just uh, keyword search every reference that mentions Eden, Amen. and it can refer. And it does seem like that it's referring to a particular location. It can refer to that. Some people argue that it could be reference to a person's name, though. That's the reason why they try to counter argue that. But uh, I think the easiest is opening up two possibilities. One, it could be a mountain. One, it could be just a location. Now, going back to verse 9. So, uh, verse 8. So, he put a, planted a garden eastward in Eden. Oh, I forgot one more thing that's interesting. Okay, go to the book of Luke. Book of Luke. I forgot this part. Luke chapter, I think, 21. Luke chapter 
22, excuse me, it will be chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and then we'll look at uh, verse 39, verse 39. So let me give you something interesting here. So is it possible to have a garden in a mountain? Yeah, because Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane in the Mount of Olives. So it's very possible. Okay, so we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. And then we'll look at verse... Uh, where's that verse? I just lost it. Uh, 39. And he came out and went, and as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. Wow. See that? So he went to the Mount of Olives. But we all know this to be, as it was called, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Where Jesus prayed. So the other passages that show it to be the Garden of Gethsemane is obviously Matthew chapter, uh, I'm just going to say this briefly. Uh, you can rewind this. Matthew 26, verse 36 through 46. Mark 14, verse 32 through 42. And John chapter 14, verse 31. And chapter 18, verse 1. All right. But anyway, that's beside the point. We all know it's a garden. Anyway, going back to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Okay, I got more interesting stuff, so I got to hurry. Now, at uh, the latter part of verse 8, it says... And there he put the man whom he had formed. So that's where, so God created man from the dust of the ground and created him. And then he put him into the garden. So it may be that God created man from Eden. And then from Eden, he put him at the garden of Eden. Okay. Think about also in history. Why do people attribute something high and spiritual? the top of a mountain like the Greeks did with their gods and Zeus uh, Mount Olympus etc and they also talked about uh, in Korea this is a matter of fact they attributed high spirits during the old days of shamanism to mountains they consider that as more significant spirits but for some of you who don't know that's why Korean churches have these prayer mountains so you might think that's a spiritual thing, but historically it's actually a very pagan thing. You might think, really, what is that? History, uh, it came from shamanism, and then Buddhism came to the scene, and that's why they built up their temples in the mountains. And then the so-called Christian churches, which is mostly charismatic doctrine, that was born from a mingling of shaman Buddhism with charismatic doctrines. They combined it together because a lot of the shamanism doctrines and Buddhist teachings match with charismatic doctrines. And Christians ask me, what's wrong with charismatic doctrine? <laughs> so then, that's why we make a big emphasis on right doctrine. It's so important. If you don't do that, then uh, guess what? The pagans will get that. It costs souls. It can cost souls. Anyway, long story short, they combined uh, what the Buddhists and shamans did with the s spiritual presence in mountains and that's why they built prayer mountains. Okay? Anyway, going back to Genesis 2. All right. So much knowledge here, but it's going to take too much time to say everything. So I got to skip all this so I can do 9 and 10 and 11. 11, it's time about the four rivers. I don't know if I'm going to get there. Verse 9. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So God, out of the ground, he made every single tree that is pleasant to the sight of man. So everything that you see is pleasant. Every tree that he grew out of the ground. And good for food. It was also good to eat. Pleasant to eat. Now notice he mentions the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. He puts that as something separate. That's interesting. We'll come back to that later. Okay? So then the tree of life he says, in the midst of the garden. And then, if you keep reading on, it says, so it's in the middle, the center of the garden. He puts the tree of life. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's also in the midst of the garden. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
What is the tree of life? And what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So let's look at uh, several passages. And then we'll find out what this tree of life is. And what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The common thing that you'll see from people is that Adam and Eve ate an apple. But actually that is false. The Bible shows that uh, what Adam and Eve ate. So it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So the tree of knowledge and good and evil would be referring to grapes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, why do you say that, Pastor? Go to number six. Mm -hmm. Number six. Yep. I'm going to number six. Come on, brother. Because think about the best fruit in the Bible that always attributed it to sin, mm -hmm. to being forbidden mm -hmm. to intake. Think about the particular fruit, the best fruit out of all fruits. Apple wasn't forbidden by God. It's something that's... Uh, likened to pictures of silver, a positive yeah. reference. Yeah. But great, for some weird reason, it's always negative. It only became positive when God came to the scene. When Jesus said, uh, this grape juice pictures my blood. Mm -hmm. Why did Jesus have to do that? Because the blood of mankind was corrupted before. Mm -hmm. yep. So there's a corruption, so likened to grapes. So God, Jesus Christ... That's why he says, I will drink it new yes. with you. He said that when he partook in the Lord's Supper with the disciples. Amen. Interesting, right? Yes. So that's why uh, the best prospect, if I cannot say 100% proof where God says, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is grapes. Well, it may not say that, but out of all the fruits, there's no other fruit that's a better candidate and that you can topple an argument than the grape. So that's at least that much I can say. Look at Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Notice that a Nazarite, what he was supposed to do at verse 3. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry. Look at that. He for, that was forbidden to drink uh, or to partake in grapes. Now, some people might say, well, you can't say that it's a, uh, the grapes came from a tree because it comes from a vine. So there's no such thing as grapes growing on trees. However, if you look up in the Bible at verse 4, look at how the Bible words it. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the what? Vine tree. God don't think so. He calls a vine tree. What does that mean again? What that means again is Genesis 1. You keep thinking terminologies and words. That's your problem. God at Genesis chapter 1, he's not giving you scientific terminologies here. That's why scientists think that, oh, I debunked God because a whale is not a fish. It's a mammal. Well, God don't deem it fit to write mammal there. He, th he thought that was silly. So God's like, no, if I see a creature moving in the water, I, I want to call it a fish. Let me have my right. Yeah. I created it, not you scientists. So let me call it what I want to call it. Amen. God has copyrights Amen. Amen. to that one. Yeah. So scientists steal that and say, no, it's a mammal. God, they should be sued, every single one of them. All universities would be broke by now. I mean, there would be no Berkeley. There would be none of these uh, colleges and universities would exist if God, God really did what he did. But God is merciful and gracious and let them be yes. and make them and let them mock him on his use of terms. So, see, you can't disprove God by, you know, this is a scientific term. Why didn't God choose that term? I mean, the point is this, is that the Bible, it has a lot of interesting scientific references, but God is not interested in boring you out with scientific terms. He just wants to give you a background story. Yeah. Let him use whatever words yeah. you want. Okay. So it's that simple. So then with the vine tree, he deems it at, at that sense. So whether it was a literal thing where it has, you know, like an oak tree where there's like this, all this wood coming out and then all this green shrubbery surrounding it, whether it was like that, where it's a unique thing, or whether it's just a vine itself and then the Lord may have grown a tree 
in the middle of that so that the vines can go around it, either or or however way the Lord does it, he he does it to be a vine tree, Amen. however way it is, whether it be a literal uh, great growing on literal vines or it be a tree itself or whatever it wrapped itself around. Mm -hmm. But if you think about that, that's why it makes sense if you see it like this way where the grapes are growing. Right. Did you notice this is right. where su where someone subtle yep. can yep. mingle in there? Yep. Isn't that interesting? The snake, right? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we're going to look at the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And then I want you to go to, um, we'll go to that passage last. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And then we'll look at verse 29 through 30. 29 through 30. But before we go on over here, let's go to uh, the book of John. John, I'm only going to show you one passage. Literally, this can go on for two-hour Bible study, but I'm not going to do that. So I got to try to make it as simple as possible, and time's almost up. So I have to at least finish this part. Go to 1 John chapter 2. Now, what, what would be the tree of life? What would be the tree of life? The tree of life, now again, this is what I gather from other Bible-believing teachers. The tree of life, it could be olives. It could be olives. You might say, why is that? Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gave death. It's death and it gave sin. Think of the best fruit that attributed to death and sin. Yeah. Grapes. Mm -hmm. Think of the best fruit. And by the way, fun fact, which is interesting. Olives, they're known to, uh, some people say they're fruit, not vegetable. Okay, so that's interesting. So then think of the best fruit that would be attributed to life. And then who's the one that gives you life? The Holy Spirit. And then a, a da fact. Didn't we already read the verse of Genesis 2? God breathed his spirit and he received life. What is the spirit attributed to? The olive oil, anointing oil. From olives. First John chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Who's the one abiding in you? That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's plain. We're not going to look at those passages, but that's pretty plain at John 14 and John 16. The Holy Spirit's abiding in you. But anyway, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So notice that this is referring to the Holy Spirit guiding and leading you into all truth. Now, Jeremiah 31. Here we go. And then go to Job 15. Job 15. So I think I'll have to start with Job 15 before I go to Jeremiah 31. All right, look at Job 15. Now, look at the interesting note here. At Job 15, why would the Bible talk about both of these fruits together? Grapes and olives. Did you realize that? Look at Job 15. The Word of God is an amazing book. It has a lot of things that uh, we haven't thought about or seen before. But the Lord shows a lot of hidden things. All right, we're going to look at the book of Job 15 and verse 33. Verse 33. It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. He shall shake off his, look at this, unripe grape as the vine, and shall cast off his flower as the Olive. Now look, it's talking about a certain timing and season of grapes and olives. Yeah. Wow. A timing. In other words, it hasn't been matured yet. Okay. Now, if the grape has not matured, then it's sour. 
And God can liken that to, he connects it to death, actually. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Look at this, verse 30. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. So how do you, why do you die for your sin? He puts this fruit there. Every man that eateth the what? Sour grape. His teeth shall be set on edge. Now look at this. So then God attributes death to the grape. So I, I see it more and more as the grape where they partook in the fruit. Okay. There's no other fruit you can find in the Bible than that. Now, t thinking about that thought, then if Jeremiah, if we add Jeremiah's statement, death is also attributed when it's not mature, it's sour. Okay. Now, ready for this? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. No. Oh, All right, so, so, okay. So here's the idea. If it's sour, then could Adam and Eve partook in the fruit when it was sour, immature? They weren't ready yet. They weren't ready yet. Did you hear what I just said? They weren't ready yet. If that's the case, why didn't they eat the tree of life all this time? Fun fact, olives and grapes, if you research them, so I don't know how much is true, but I'm just giving you from what I know from other Bible-believing teachers, the timing of their season, if it's immature, it's close to an approximate timeline together, and they both have not yet fully matured and developed. And when you look at the grape and the olive, when they haven't really bloomed or blossomed, so to speak, they look very similar. They look very similar, which is why God may have put them in the midst of the garden together. And that may have been the reason why it wasn't, they couldn't eat out of the tree of light yet. Why? It wasn't the right time yet. And hence, it could be the reason why God didn't allow them to partake in this fruit because it wasn't the right time yet. So then, in other words, if it's limited, to a season. So all of this then is limited to a season. So if this is limited to a season or two, let's stretch this even more. We could probably time when Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden. Okay. So they could have been there during the time of winter then, probably. So they could have been there during the time of winter, but because it's such a paradise, there is no... Uh, winter season where they have to suffer. And Adam and Eve may not have been in the Garden of Eden for a long time. It could have been at least one or at the most three seasons. It could have been somewhere between one to three seasons. And that would make a lot of sense because Satan is not just going to dilly-dally and let them enjoy paradise for many years. He's going to immediately take action because he's angry. That's what Satan does in your life when you're serving God, right? When you're doing what's right. Yes. So they could have been there during the time of winter. And then uh, that, and then it was during that time. And that's why some people, you see it all over the world now, where they uh, take references about a dark winter. Or they talk about winter is coming, etc. Why is there such a doom and gloom attributed to that? Perhaps because that's when this serpent came in at that timetable, had them partake in an immature fruit. And then they died in their sin that time. And that's why the book of Job, it talks about a timing season of grapes and olives. And then God, he has to set it right, the grape and olive. If you look at Job 15, it gives that reference that he has to cast off the unripe or the, uh, the grapes and the olives that are not ripe, that are not good. What are these four rivers? You're not going to see these two on your map. You can guess these two. We have to stop here. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, you'll dismiss today's teachings with your blessing, with so much knowledge of the scripture and appreciation of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.